All right. Well, an official good morning or good afternoon and welcome to everyone. My name is Megan Barrett. I am the director of the Iowa Quilt Museum, although today I am joining you from home. If you're not in Iowa, um, I'll just let you know we've gotten at least eight inches of snow here in Winterset and other places across uh, other higher amounts across Iowa. So it's a snowy day here and I'm working from home, but we have four fabulous guests also joining us from their homes. And we are not necessarily talking so much about the quilts in the exhibit today. We are talking about Melanie and Carol and Diane and Jessica and how they are a part of the Iowa Quiltscape. So just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, please do keep yourself muted and your video off for right now. Um, later on, if you want, uh, there may be a time at the end where we'll ask you to go ahead and turn on your video if you'd like to comment or share. Um, if you would like to pose a question or add a comment, you're welcome to do that in the chat window. And many of you have already entered into the chat window where it is that you're joining us from. And we're happy to have people from across the country and even some visitors from Canada and the UK. Um, it's wonderful to see you all today. Um, we're gonna start with a little, um, just kind of a round robin from all of our guests. And I'm gonna give them a very short introduction myself and then ask them to um, introduce themselves to you and tell you a little bit about how they are involved in quilting in the state of Iowa, maybe a little bit how they got started on their quilting journey um, and what kind of is their specialty or um, their area of focus within the world of quilting. So just because she's first on my paper here, I'm gonna start with Diane Murtha. Um, Diane, I met, oh gosh, I don't remember exactly how or where I met you. I believe you attended um, an event at the Iowa Quilt Museum. Um, and then she um, attended a Meet the Teacher event for us that we sponsored for Guilds. Um, Diane is in the Quad Cities and started the Quad Cities Art Quilt Group there. She has written for the All Iowa Shop Hop Magazine, has an upcoming article in American Quilter Magazine, uh, teachers and lectures via Zoom, and coaches Guilds on how to use Zoom. And in October, she had two quilts in two separate exhibits showing simultaneously at Paducah's National Quilt Museum. So I'm going to, let's see, I'm gonna show only Diane for a moment here and let her tell us a little bit more about herself. Go ahead, Diane. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm honored to be here joining you all today. Uh, I am coming from sunny Florida at the moment. We're down here for a couple months. I started my quilting journey when I was about seven years old. My grandmother taught me to quilt. I started by hand quilting, um, used um, machine quilting for the most part and did very traditional quilting for 20 some years. About 10 years ago, I gravitated to art quilting and um, I have started doing challenge quilt projects and that has completely reinvigorated my love of quilting. Uh, following the rules uh, and the boundaries that challenge quilt projects provide has given me some structure, but it's, it has also forced me to learn many new things. And I have gotten out of my box. I'm very excited about it. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about quilting. Well, maybe that's the menopause that wakes me up in the middle of the night. But once I'm awake, I'm thinking about quilting. <laughs> and I never would have guessed 10 years ago when I started down this art quilting journey that uh, today I would have quilts in, in books, articles and magazines, quilts traveling the exhibit uh, nationally and internationally, um, and also lecturing and, uh, and teaching quilts. So I'm very excited, very blessed with everything that I've um, been able to learn and share and all the support I've gotten from family, friends, and of course, fellow quilters. Thanks, Diane. And so when we come back a little bit later, um, we'll talk to you more about um, quilt challenges and some of the, the things that you've learned or experienced through the idea of quilt challenges. That's kind of your, um, 
your special topic, I think, when you do your presentations, mostly, it sounds it like. Is. And, and um, Megan, we met when I came to do the airing of the quilt. In oh, April. that's right. That yes. Old April. <laughs> Yes, that was the last year that we used April for the airing of the quilts. After that, we decided that June would be much more temperate for us. Um, and I can't remember exactly how I found your name, um, but I invited you to come have a bridge, uh, a display in one of our bridges. Um, and yes, you were a trooper. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna pass things over now to Melanie McNeil. Melanie is a quilter, designer, teacher, and writer who specializes in making medallion quilts. So we're moving from the art quilts to artistic medallions. After making her first quilt in 2000, she swore she would never make another. I love that, Melanie. Now, hundreds of quilts later, she might never stop. She grew up in a family of creative people and went on to a career in investment management. So she sees quilting as the perfect way to bridge her analytical and artistic sides. I have a friend very much like that, Melanie. Um, she blogs at catbirdquilts.wordpress uh, and you can also find her on Instagram at catbirdquiltstudio. So, and she's coming to us from Iowa City today. So I will turn things over to Melanie for a few moments. Hi everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here today. So thank you for inviting me and I'm really excited to hear more from Carol and from Diane as well. And if, if Jessica's with us at some point, uh, that will be fun too. Um, as, as Megan said, I'm from the Iowa City area. I actually live in Coralville and we had about six inches of snow last night. So it was, um, it was enough to have a good reason to stay home. Um, my, my first quilt was in 2003. As for many people, I um, decided to make a quilt because I had a grandbaby on the way. And I know that that is, I've heard that theme a lot. And as Megan said, when I made that quilt, it was really a miserable experience. I didn't know anything. I just, you know, I grew up in a house, my mother sewed everything and I thought, well, how hard could it be? It's just straight line sewing and I can do that. I didn't have a rotary cutter. I didn't even know those things existed. Uh, I didn't know what patterns were and so I just cut squares and from plaid so I was trying to cut the right sizes of squares along those plaid lines. It was um, not great and, <laughs> <laughs> and yet you know then then there's more grandbabies and what are you supposed to do about that and then the these grandbabies older siblings who didn't get quilts and by, before I knew it, I was in deep. So that was in 2003, but it wasn't until 10 years later that I really started to understand um, medallion quilts, which is my specialty, as a completely different thing. They're, they're not like block quilts in so many different ways. And I, I realized that, that I was gravitating towards making them. One of the reasons that I love them so much is because they're, they aren't block quilts. When you, when you have a block quilt, you've got, uh, you've got this thing or maybe two things, an A block and a B block, and you make a whole bunch of them. And you can imagine pretty well what the thing's gonna look like when you're done. But when I make medallion quilts, like this one behind me, I had no idea when I started that what it would look like. So it was this adventure that I went on. And um, I love that adventure and that's that's what's taken me through to medallion quilts. So I could tell you a lot more, but in the interest of, of moving things along, I'll go ahead and stop there. All right, thanks, Melanie. I'm interested to hear more about your process um, with designing and making medallion quilts. Um, small confession right now, I, I'm kind of a newbie quilter myself um, and back in the fall, like in September, one of my kiddos decided that he would like to make a quilt with me. So then the other two who are of that age also decided that they wanted to make a quilt. So I purchased fabric and I had them pick out patterns. And then we started, I am in the process of making three quilts simultaneously. And I make, I try to schedule a little time with each of them each week. I would not recommend that. Um, but the reason <laughs> I bring that up is because one of them is all half square triangles. And even though I'm making them eight at a time, 
I am so sick of making and trimming half square triangles. So that whole, um, the block quilt repetition, I'm, I'm getting that. I'm <laughs> so maybe, maybe I'll try a medallion quilt next, Melanie. <laughs> I'll, I'll help you with that. Let me know what you need. <laughs> awesome. Well, I got to get these three done first. I cannot start anything else until I get one of them at least off my sewing table. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Plunkett. Um, Jessica, I think, let's see, I got to remember, I think I met Jessica in 2018 when she came to the Quilt Museum for a lecture being given by Victoria Finlay Wolf. Um, and Jessica is a modern quilter, so she was obviously drawn to that Victoria Finlay Wolf exhibit. Um, and Jessica is actually going to be exhibiting quilts in the Modern Quilt Guild Quilt Con this year, which is the, it's going to be virtual, but it's the annual quilt show of the Modern Quilt Guild. Um, she has one that she designed um, and then one that was juried into the show. So, and as she says, she was inspired to start that quilt after hearing the Victoria Finley Wolf lecture in 2018. So I, there's hope for me maybe yet, Jessica, that I have a little time yet to finish these that I've started. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica to tell us a little bit more about her quilting journey. Awesome, thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm in Waukee, Iowa, and we got 12 inches of snow. Yeesh. So my morning was not spent quilting. My morning was spent <laughs> shoveling snow. <clears throat> so, um, I am, I guess you could say that I am a modern quilter, although I just love quilting altogether. Um, my journey started a little later. My great grandmother was a quilter, made beautiful quilts, um, and I had every chance to learn from her and I never did. And the quilt hopefully that we look at later that Megan was talking about was inspired by her and will be um, displayed this year at QuiltCon together. Um, the virtual event from the Modern Quilt Guild. Um, but when I turned 32, just out of the blue, I said, it's time to finally start to, to learn how to quilt. And so I did. Um, I showed up at a quilt store and they were had an intro to quilting class and I took it and I have never looked back. I left that class. I went home. I designed three quilts and made them for family members that year. And I've never looked back. Um, I have a particular fondness for black and pink uh, color palette and quilts. Um, I do not make every quilt in that color palette, but I absolutely envision it in that way. Otherwise, I love really bold, bright colors. Um, you will rarely find white in a quilt that I make. And um, I'm a member of the Central Iowa Modern Quilt Guild, which is the local chapter of the larger MQG. Um, and I, yeah, I spend all my time thinking about, breathing about, thinking about, sleeping about, quilting. I love it. <laughs> and Jessica has also been an exhibitor for us at the airing of the quilts. Um, her quilts were hanging from the porticos of our historic courthouse in this um, in 2020 when we did the airing of the quilts. We actually moved the date into later June um, because at that point we had no idea what was happening pandemic wise. Um, and Jessica's really bold designs. My favorite one, Jessica, was the um, dump truck front end loader, the kind of um, the big machinery piece. My sons were big fans of that one. Yeah, the excavator quilt. It there is a go. it's a pixelated version. Although I I ended up using the same colors. There are twenty. Uh, there's two thousand pieces to it. Uh, my family is all in the construction industry and just a really fast side story of where that quilt came from. Uh, my brother um, was the last person in my family or extended family of friends that I made a quilt for because he's a very lovely person, but like I, I, I wanted to make something that he would really think was neat. And just everything that I tried, I was like, nope, even though he would have never said, you know, an unkind word or anything. And he's been involved in construction since he was literally like two or three years old. And out of the blue one day I said, I'm gonna make a pixelated excavator. And he, I can tell from his heart, he loves it. He's commented on the craftsmanship of it. He loves it. And so that's what it was born out of, just a love and desire to make a quilt that 
that my brother would appreciate. Cool. All right, and so I'm gonna introduce our last guest now. Carol Bodensteiner is, um, Carol, I forgot to ask you, shame on me, if you are actually a quilter, um, you'll have to tell us that. But the reason that Carol is joining us today is because she has authored a book um, and, oops, I've copied Jessica's thing on here twice, sorry. She's authored a book um, that she wanted to share with us and it is the history of quilts from a family member. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that, Carol. Thank you, Megan, and, and thank you everyone for, uh, for showing up today um, to talk about quilting. I probably fall into the category of reluctant quilter. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I grew up on a, a farm in Eastern Iowa, and so uh, quilting was part of my life from earliest times. Uh, when we didn't have anything to do, which was always a dangerous thing to say on the farm, but when we <laughs> didn't have anything to do, we would, mom would sit us down with little cardboard templates. Uh, Melanie, your point about wheels and stuff, mm -mm. little cardboard templates and a pair of scissors and a stack of, of uh, old uh, suits or flannel shirts or whatever, and we would cut six inch or four inch blocks, uh, and they would eventually make their way into quilts like this one. Um, which is in my book. Now, um, in the house, I didn't know about this at the time. In fact, I didn't find this out until uh, the early 2000s were pieces of quilts that uh, blocks and squares and things that were somewhat assembled but not entirely assembled there, uh, uh, in any way that my grandmother had started uh, before she was married in 1914. And who knows why they weren't finished, but in about in the early 2000s, my mother brought all this out and said to me, Carol, you have to get these finished. And <laughs> I'm a writer, not a quilter. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, but mom was very persistent. And I fortunately have one of my sisters in law who is an avid quilter, Anita is on the on the call today, who worked with me. She assembled and I then finished quilting, hand quilting or tying or whatever was required. And all the while I was doing that, I was thinking about writing. And so I eventually, just in the last year, wrote this book, Stitched Through Time, The Story of Libby Haylock's Quilts. And so my, um, uh, it tells the story, it tells the history. And to the extent that I could uh, get stories from my mom, uh, because she wanted me to do it. And so we would talk every time I was every weekend when we talked, she would, I would ask questions, she would tell me more, I would think about it, it would, you know, so eventually this became the story. And um, I last year was able to gift uh, these quilts out to family members. And uh, that was uh, a really special experience because now the quilts are over a hundred years old and had at, at least a hundred years old. There's one that's potentially from the Civil War era, um, but that was uh, that. I probably still call myself a reluctant quilter, uh, but um, I was really delighted to have this opportunity eventually to to do this quilting and write this book that tells the story. Excellent. All right, give me just a moment, everybody, to put back up the four or five spotlights so we can see everybody. We're envisioning this that, you know, we're all sitting at a table together and we're having a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and um, just chatting a little bit. So um, if you have something that you'd like to add to the conversation or a question that you'd like to ask, please feel free to um, pop that into the chat window and the conversation can go wherever we want it to go. I'm just the moderator trying to, um, you know, relay things and, and keep the conversation moving. So um, we've got a reluctant traditional quilter who finished some historical quilts and wrote a really great book about those. We've got an art quilter, a modern quilter, and a medallion quilter. Um, Melanie, I often call um, your style kind of a contemporary traditional is, do you think that's an accurate 
because medallion quilts are really steeped in tradition and history, but you seem to have a more contemporary take on that, yeah? Yes, I would say that uh, medallion, the idea of a medallion quilt is, it's just a format and it does cross all time periods. So if you look at the very earliest bed quilts from uh, let's say the late 1700s, it's the same format then as what we're seeing now with modern quilters using, you know, different color sets and different fabrics and some different configurations. It's all the same. All a medallion quilt is, is you have some central thematic format or uh, motif, and then you have some number of borders around it. So um, that's, that really defines what a medallion is and you can do that any way you want. So one of the things that I've done with my blog site is I've tried to create and uh, provide lessons for people in how they can go ahead and make their own medallion quilt, their own style, their own, um, their own color sets, their own shapes that they like, and figure out how to do that in a way that is pleasing to the eye because it's looking at some of those design principles and elements that create a good quality design. Everybody can make a medallion quilt. You, it doesn't depend on being any kind of an expert seamstress or quilter at all. It's, it's, a, it's a very individual process and, and you don't need a pattern and you don't even need me to tell you how to do it. But if you want me to help, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> sure. So Melanie, since, okay, no, go ahead, Diane. She did, we, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, I see a great string connection between all five of us, um, between you know the way we challenge ourselves and we learn. So Carol was a little reluctant to learn to quilt, but she did it. Uh, Jessica is designing, so that's a, a completely different kind of aspect to quilting. And same with um, um, Melanie's medallions. Um, you know, every ring. I mean, you're you're using some creativity to challenge yourself on, on each ring you're doing. And, and you, Megan, trying to do three quilts simultaneously with, with three young children, that's a challenge too. So good for, good for all of us in um, you know, stretching ourselves in the hobby that we love. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of my questions, and we've got some coming into the chat window that I'll read off to you, but one of my questions from me as kind of a newbie quilter and probably most people who are on this conversation are, are far more seasoned than I am. Um, but how did each of you make that leap from um, quilting? You know, I, I assume most people, when they start quilting, they start by copying somebody else's pattern, even if it's just something that you've seen. How did you make that leap from that to designing yourselves? Because it sounds like all three of you design. And then Carol, when you were finishing quilts, was it really obvious what they were all intended to be? Or did you have to do some designing in that yourself and kind of, or maybe some guesswork in how they were intended to be finished? So um, anybody? Um, I, I would jump in here because Anita, my sister-in-law, when all of these, um, mom sent me home with the box of all of these pieces, uh, my first thought was Anita because she is a quilter. And um, I think she did, well, she did more than 50 some quilts last year. <laughs> That's how she spent COVID time. But uh, anyway, um, she put them all out on the floor and, that, and started moving, square, uh, moving blocks around and seeing how they looked. And it was at that point that I started to appreciate how beautiful these quilts were and how, what the potential was, and, and also what artistic um, flair is, is used in putting together a really beautiful quilt. And uh, you have some pictures, I mean, we have a pineapple quilt, we have a grandmother's flower garden quilt, we have a shoe fly in basket quilt. I mean, there are just beautiful quilts, even in colors that I would not have imagined uh, going together, uh, Jessica, you, the whole point about pink, there's one quilt that has quite a lot of pink in it. And when I first saw those, I thought, Ew. <laughs> don't love that. But when it was all together, it, because that's the only quilt, that was a shoe fly and basket 
the only quilt that there were two that were the same pattern, but different color schemes. And that was amazing to see. That was amazing for me to see. And those pictures, I have pictures of all of the quilts in, in the book because that's, that's what the story is. Right, I, Melanie, I see you one second. And I just might note that um, Carol's book um, is going to be available in the Iowa Quilt Museum gift shop, um, which is kind of the impetus for us, you know, having this discussion today. Um, but we will, before we leave today, I'll be sure to put the link up there of how you can purchase a copy of, of Carol's book. Um, and then Melanie and Diane and Jessica are, are all welcome to put things in the chat window of how you can find them as well. So go ahead, Melanie. Yeah, I was just relative to the question of how, how do you start moving towards designing your own work? Is, is that a good summary of the question? Yep. Um, for me, partly it was a matter of, um, I didn't realize that those things that were written in quilting magazines were things called patterns. <laughs> and I mean, that might sound really stupid, but it's, it's almost literally true. It just didn't occur to me that that was, that was a thing called a pattern. And, and I didn't actually ever learn how to read patterns from start to finish. I did learn how to make blocks. And so that was, that was fortunate, but I didn't, I, I just, I still don't know how I don't, I just don't do good at that. So, um, for me, it was really also between that, not, not understanding patterns and also just, I guess, being kind of an independent little snot. I just wanted to make things that were my own, my own thing. So I, I have very, very rarely actually used a pattern and even then typically just for design as opposed to the cutting instructions and so forth are, they're almost meaningless to me. It's, it's a little brain glitch, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> a brain speciality. There you go. Thank you, teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, go ahead. Um, so I, I do design my own patterns and I design a lot of my own work, but I also use other people's patterns too. Um, but I think what inspired me was, like I said, I, I literally walked out of my intro to quilt class, had a phenomenal teacher, loved it. And, and I'm not kidding. I went home and got out a sketchbook and I started drawing those first three quilts. Like I said, I just, I, there was no rhyme or reason of which three family members I picked. It's who's, it's, I had ideas and I just wanted, I think for me, quilting is my canvas. I can't paint, I can't sculpt, I can't do any other art for it, like at all. Like I can barely cut construction paper out with my five-year-old, right? Like I just, it, other art forms just don't connect with me or I don't feel like what I can make resonates with me, but quilting does. And so it is my artboard, it is my canvas. And so when I get ideas, and when I'm trying to convey a thought or a message or a feeling, like it goes into fabric. And so I just start sketching and start cutting and start playing. And um, that's, I feel like if you feel inspired in that way, you'll reach that point where you're just sort of driven to start cutting the fabric and figuring it out as you go. Diane? Well, I'll first say that my mom would say that I argued from like the time I was a toddler. I mean, I remember two plus two and I'd say, well, why is it four? Why is it four? <laughs> but uh, you know, starting with a traditional pattern, I would, I would was curious enough to say, well, what would happen if I turned the block this way? Or what if I substitute this color? Or you know, what if I didn't do that at all and I did something different? So part of it is curiosity. Part of it is also being stubborn and saying, well, why, why can't I do it, you know, a different way? Uh, I would say uh, two things. One, it, it's good to have a sense of humor. And two, there are no quilt police. So don't worry, it, you know, it, it, try it. It, 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 it it's not going to hurt anything. Um, I, I'm, I transitioned to art quilts, but I do not have a design or an art background. So I have made many mistakes <laughs> and learned things along the way, which is where the sense of humor uh, really does come into play. Um, but uh, I, I agree with what Jessica said too. You will 
kind of just naturally try uh, falling into it. You might say, well, I'm going to try this a little bit. And then I might try something else. Or I'll start drawing something and I'll just see, does it look like it's um, something that I can construct? Yeah. And, and then again, asking questions of your friends. This is, you know, show them, I, I think I want to make this. Is it doable or what do you suggest? Maybe you need to tweak something a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky to have yeah. my sister who is on the call. My sister is, is also a quilter. And although we have a, a big overlap in what we like, we also have very different styles from each other. So if I'm really stuck, and in fact, she, she and I did this quilt behind me together. If I'm really stuck, I just think, what would Kathy do? because she would do something differently than I would. And that, that helps break my, my uh, thinking about, I, 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 tend to get, I tend to get locked in and rigid with how I do things. So that, that's a little way that I use to um, kind of go another way. So I'm gonna go to the chat window and read out some of the things that have come in. Um, somebody has asked, what was the process of each of you getting recognized by the Iowa Quilt Museum? So. Like, how did you make it on the show today? Um, and my answer to that is, um, I don't know. Um, no, that's not true. Melanie was recommended to me um, by somebody else that I know. And actually, Melanie, I first, your name was kind of first thrown my way as um, a potential presenter in regards to your research on the um, quilts in the Underground Railroad. Um, Jessica came to the quilt museum and introduced herself to me. Diane, I still cannot remember how I first got a hold of your name. Somebody probably gave it to me, um, or you might have reached out and said, Hey, I'm new to Iowa and I want you to know who I am. And then I said, Hey, I've got this spot I need to fill for the airing of the quilts. It's going to be really awesome. It's going to be really cold. Um, and then Carol reached out to me about her book after. Um, our presentation two weeks ago with Tangela Irby. And so it's really kind of word of mouth or people have connected us somehow. Um, one of our goals as the Iowa Quilt Museum is to really help bring together the quilting world within the state and help make these connections. So the Jessicas of the world of Iowa know what the Carols are doing and the Melanies know what the Dianes are doing. Um, but to do that, we have to know about them. And, and I say we, and it's really I, because I'm kind of a staff of one. Um, so if you are in Iowa and you know of somebody um, who I should be connected with, please be the person who connects us. Um, I've got several people lined up for our upcoming programs that are actually only scheduled to go through March 9th. Um, but I could potentially see this going beyond that. Um, so that's a long answer to that question. Um, Janice asks to all of you, how have your quilting styles changed through this last year where maybe you've had either more or less time to quilt in quarantine? And Carol, I'm curious about the timeline of your book. Um, when did you start this whole process and how, how long did it take you to make those quilts up and write your book and such. So maybe we, yeah. I don't know, Diane, what, what has changed for you this year in regards to quilting? Well, um, this, this year has, has been, you know, mixed blessings. Um, when, when COVID hit, uh, we were actually on our way to Arizona where I was going to teach at a RV rally COVID hit, everything got canceled, and we ended up hiking uh, and spending more time in Arizona, which was lovely. Um, but uh, because of COVID, a lot of my lectures and um, workshops were canceled or rescheduled to, to this next year. Um, I had several issues, uh, uh, incidents where my family um, had some health issues and actually moved in with us for a while. And so the blessing is because I wasn't traveling, I was able to be home and you know invite them into our home and, and help them. So that that was good. Um, the frustrating part was I'm on Facebook and all my friends are saying, "Oh, I'm stuck at home and oh, I've made all these quilts and oh, I'm working on all my UFOs." And I thought, "I'm not doing any quilting." <laughs> so 
that part was a little frustrating, but you know, there's a plan and it all comes, you know, comes out fine. Um, I did take the time to do an, uh, the English paper piecing project that I think I sent a picture of and design my own technique. So that was, you know, every morning, just, you know, 30 minutes of hand sewing with my cup of coffee. Um, and so I was really trying to um, um, embody the slow stitching, just relax, enjoy the moment, you know, it is what it is um, and just, do a little with my hand sewing and just say if that's all I get done today that's what I what I did I, I did take the time to um I would say revive my sewing room I got some new carpet and some new lights <laughs> um so that that was a, a a fun addition um but sewing wise quilting wise I did not accomplish very much Jessica, how about you this year? I know you've got a five-year-old at home, which has provided some extra challenges in quarantine stages. It sure has, yeah. <laughs> kind of, I kind of went through, I, I guess I'll say maybe three stages during quarantine related to my quilting. So the first one early on was I had really just started to work on this quilt that I've referred to that I was making as if my great grandma and I got to make it together. And it's the first in a series and it's very important to me, but it's also very hard to work on. Um, and I'll tell you why later I sent a picture. I hope we could take a look and I'll, I'll kind of tell the story about it. Um, it's, it's, very, it's a very emotional quilt for me. And so at the start of quarantine, of course, that's what I tackled. Um, I, 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 it's, you know, everything around us, we didn't really know what was going on, right? It was hard to understand what was happening and how things were changing. And like, I, oddly enough, working on something that was equally emotional actually was good for me. Um, and so I spent the first kind of part of quarantine kind of focused on that. And I worked on other projects. I'm a quilter who has 17 projects at any one time, I feel like probably that's a realistic number. The second stage of quarantine, um, so quilting, so the actual process, just in case anyone isn't familiar, like after you've made the quilt top and you've made your quilt sandwich and now it actually needs the thread to keep it all together is my weakest area of the process. But I've been working on that steadily in the last several years. And one day I was sitting in my sewing studio. Again, this is kind of mid, mid last year. And I looked up at um, my shelf of 39 quilt tops and I said, oh, it's time. And so I cut backings, battings. I have quilted, um, I have quilted, I believe 34 of them. Um, and I'm okay that there's a couple that are left over, but like that weight, that literal and physical weight of those quilts just sitting there. Cause a lot of those were either practice pieces or just like maybe a class that I took and, and they didn't have a purpose. Maybe they weren't going to someone specific or they weren't for a show or anything else. And so they just sat there. And now that they've kind of been cleared out, it, it, it literally cleared my brain and cleared my focus. And so at the end of the year and now start of this year, I am like on a very good, happy explosion of new ideas quilting. Like I have been making so many things and I am for, for just me personally, I'm so proud of them. I think they're great pieces for where I am at in my quilting journey. Um, I'm trying tons of new things, new techniques that I rarely ever try or have never tried. And so I feel like I have been fortunate that I sort of had those kind of three major compartmentalized pieces that I could go through during this quarantine. And I'll also throw in though that yes, Megan mentioned I have a young child who is doing virtual schooling. And one of the blessings and one of the reasons I also started quilting those quilts is because I have to sit there with her the whole time. She's not old enough to, to really manage that process all by herself. So I would get those quilts quilted at night and I love hand binding. It is, it is one of my favorite parts of quilting. It's very cathartic for me. So I would get them quilted at night so that the next day I could hand bind while she was, while she does her school. And I can, you know, that's an easy start stop thing that I could do. And so um, I would say 90% of the days that we've had of, of, of uh, virtual school, I, I have done hand binding for. So it, it has all worked out very nicely for me. <laughs> Good. How about you, Melanie? 
Um, I would say that 2020 for quilting for me was actually more normal. Um, in 2019, early in the year, I was diagnosed with breast cancer mm. and went through surgery and chemo and radiation. And just as an aside, I laugh a lot when people complain about not getting to get their hair cut. I'm complaining about that too. But, you know, I have hair and I'm really happy about that. So <laughs> that's another topic. Um, but in 2019, I actually did make a number of things, but they were all very, um, most of them were, were, were pretty ordinary. They, they don't have much spark to them. There's a very ill-conceived disappearing nine patch with Thomas the Tank fabric that is just ugly. I mean, it just turned out really badly and it, it's intended to be a donation quilt anyway, but you'd still like your donation quilts to be attractive and it's, it's just not. So 2019 was just not a great year for me creatively, but 2020 was much more normal. So for me, I would say that um, it, I feel, I feel like I'm kind of back to it now. I don't know, the, the, the photos that I gave you to share are uh, all but one of them were from last year. I don't know if this is a good time to look at them. I think it is actually, thank you for that segue. I am going to go to share screen and Melanie, I've got yours pulled up right now. Okay. So you go ahead and just tell us what you wanna tell us about these quilts. Okay, um, this, this is uh, called Urn with Flowers. <laughs> and I actually finished it in the early part of 2019 and in fact, before my cancer diagnosis. So this is representative of um, very happy, creative, productive time for me. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a medallion quilt. You can see the central motif and borders surrounding it. And I, I'm trying to push myself more to, to being, um, to be more creative with my borders and not not simply just ringing around and around and around with the same thing over and over, although sometimes that works very, very well too. But at any rate, we could go, we could look at the next one. So that one was early 2019. This was actually at the beginning of 2020. Um, it's about, um, if I can remember how big it is, 40, 46 inches or something like that across. It's square, it looks, it looks simpler than it than it is. I think um, there are a lot of different layers to how how I developed this design, uh, including that the the center block, which looks pretty simple and straightforward, actually reworked that several times and turned it different directions. And um, so uh, I can't remember. Perhaps it was Diane who said something about your sense of humor and being patient. <laughs> Well, yeah, please, please have a sense of humor and be patient. And if things, if things you try don't work, try something else. It's fabric, it's all okay. There's really no harm done. You can get more, they have more at the store. <laughs> um, uh, this I made at the end of the year. This was for uh, a grand niece, or my niece, Emily had a baby named Liberty, which I think was a fantastic name for a baby girl. And Emily is an outside kind of person. She lo loves to be out. And one of the pictures she has of her new baby from, I think Liberty was a, a whole month old. She somehow ended up with three or four monarchs perched on her face. Hmm. And um, I, I'm not sure how that happened, but it was, it's the most fantastic uh, photo. So I, I made this, this uses the Ricky Tim's kaleidoscope quilt um, process. And that is a process. If you haven't used it, it's a lot of fun and it's full of surprises. Um, I made this early in the year, last year, and it is called Melting Pot. And the reason for that is because there are, there's every variety of fabric here. There are batiks, there's uh, old thimbleberries that I got from someone somewhere. There are at least two men's shirts, including the what looks like pale blue on my screen. 
there's a, a man's shirt, there's um, uh, contemporary uh, prints, there are, as I said, there's batiks, um, Marcia Durst is in there, there's Civil War repros, they're just the really broadest variety. And what this means to me is just, hey, it takes all of us. You know, it takes, it takes working class people and it takes white collar people and it takes uh, people from every origin and ethnicity. And that's what creates this beautiful piece that we've got. So it's my melting pot. Uh, there's a really long story here and I'm not gonna go into the whole thing. If you can flip back Megan to the last one for just a second, the very center of the center block, can you see the print there? Mm -hmm. Okay, go to the go to the um, the next one then, and you can see how I used it differently. Mm -hmm. This actually was from a border strip from a, a panel that Julie Pashkis designed for in the beginning fabrics, and um, it, so it was long. It wasn't it wasn't uh, uh, kind of this broad rectangle. It was a long rectangle, and I I ended up uh, cutting it once and then re-sewing it together to make it the shorter, squattier uh, rectangle. Um, I designed the birds. I used the, the flowers were fussy cut from um, two different colorways of the same tropical print that I'd bought in 2007. Um, the, the squares around the outside border are just striped fabric that I have carefully cut and re-sewn as hourglass blocks. So as I said, there's a lot longer story here, but I'll leave that there for, the, for that. Um, this one is kind of a funny thing. It, it is based on um, just, I, I've kind of taken, uh, I've created a love in myself for New Mexico. And this has uh, to me some reference to Southwest culture, but also if you look at it, it also is um, designed very much like an Amish, um, trip around the world diamond in a square format. So I've kind of mashed both of the two together, the Southwest influence and, uh, and also the Amish influence with the, the dark background and the bright colors in the, um, the piecing. Awesome. Might be all of it. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if I can back out. Carol, let's pop up to your quilts. Okay, well, they've seen that, so you can move along on that one. But uh, um, go, that one, it, this is a picture. I, I had put all the quilts on my bed so that I could show them to my family when they came for a family reunion. And, and I just took a picture of it. And I, I love this because it really gets at kind of all of the different ones. Uh, uh, there's the pineapple quilt, a crazy quilt, the oak leaf and real, grandmother's flower garden. It, they're just all there. And it's just so in my mind, it's just so beautiful to see all of them together and all of those colors. So um, next one, um, this, is, this is the oak leaf and reel. Uh, and that was really, that was the last one I did because I couldn't figure out how to quilt it. And I had the good fortune of, of talking with someone, uh, maybe uh, Paula, if she's on, uh, had come to my house and she said, sometimes less is more uh, when it comes to hand quilting. So I wound up just quilting in the white spaces and left the oak leaf and the real part. I let the quilting kind of pop it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, it really did work. And those, those squares, those individual squares are like 18 inches. Uh, the blocks are 18 inches. Uh, I, I have to get my terms right, squares and blocks. It, the blocks <laughs> are 18 inches. This was a, a real education for me doing these quilts. But uh, uh, anyway, um, some, uh, you asked uh, Megan about when I started and when I finished. And, and uh, my mom was cleaning these things, brought these out after my dad passed away and she was kind of cleaning up the house in general. And that was, in a, he died in 1999. So she got these into my hands in about 2001. And I was diligent, I worked. I worked on them steadily. 
until then she passed away in 2007. So, I mean, it took me some time here. Anita took some time, I took some time. Anyway, uh, after my mom passed away, I had been writing a book and all of, the, all of these quilts went into a blanket chest. And it was only when my family was coming for a family reunion in 2019 that I thought, this is a good chance to, to give them out to people. Well, of course they weren't finished and they weren't mm -hmm. gonna be finished by the time they showed up. So anyway, I committed myself to finishing them because 10 years had passed. And I thought it's easy to sort of see how my, they could have gone into grandma's trunk and not materialized for a hundred years, you know, cause I, I just left them there for 10 years. And I thought that would be a crime to not have them be finished. So anyway, I uh, move, go to the next one. Um, I was grateful, I wanna say to, this is the pineapple quilt. Um, this is the one that may have uh, been started in, during the Civil War, it may have been. There's a date written on it. Who wrote it there? It's 1854, who wrote it there? No idea but that would indicate sort of a civil war-ish approach to things. But because it's all been in storage for a hundred years, it's like all the fabric's brand new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, yeah, uh, then COVID, uh, COVID was my excuse and my impetus to write the book and get it done. So I started writing the book in 2020 and I finished it in 2020 because it just needed to be done. But I, I am thankful to the Quilt Museum and Marianne Fons, who directed me to Barbara Brockman's book, The Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia of Quilt Patterns. So part of what's in the book is the pattern history mm -hmm. and when it was first published and what the names were and if there was some cultural history behind where that pattern came from. So uh, I don't know if I gave you another one. I don't think so, Megan, did I? Oh, well, this is one of the shoe fly and basket quilts. And this was when I was giving them to my family. So there's pictures of my family in the book, <laughs> uh, giving them out. But this was the one that, that was also in the pink color. And I don't think I gave you the pink, the pink version of this, but uh, uh, the blue and white pattern was common in, in the things that, that grandma made. How many quilts were there, Carol, that you inherited from your grandmother and finished? There were 11. Um, and they are, uh, for some of them are, one of them, let's see, some of them are only like twin bed size, but most of them would do a, a double bed at least, and some of them bigger than that. So uh, it was not an insignificant task <laughs> to do the hand quilting on, on these. And, you know, there were a couple of them that I was able to tie, but uh, for the most part, it was hand quilting and I uh, um, can be obsessive. So I was <laughs> at it for a long time. <laughs> now were they, you said they were in various stages of completion. Some of them were just blocks and you had to complete the top where others- well, this, the is, this is, this is uh, let's take this one for an example. Um, they, some of them would be in completed blocks. So the blue and white shoe fly and, and basket was completed, mm -hmm. but then there would not be the, the uh, what, what's it called that? The sashing. The, 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 the sash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That was not there. So Anita went out and she found patterns and uh, fabrics and patterns that were consistent with, with the, um, uh, with the material that was in the blocks. So some of it is brand new fabric, but some of it is a hundred years old, but they look like they belong together. Now, the, the grandmother's flower garden is an interesting one um, because uh, I, I know I didn't give you that one, but uh, um, that one, the blocks, some of the blocks were complete but some of them were not. Mm -hmm. And those blocks, the pieces of those blocks were hand sewn together. So hundreds of thousands of little <laughs> one inch hexagons uh, were hand sewn together. It was really astounding. And um, let's see, 
um, but Anita found material and she created, she didn't, she didn't hand sew them. She told me she wasn't gonna, but, but she, she put the muslin together. She put the rest of those blocks together enough to complete out a quilt. And, uh, you know, so she, she did the hard work in my opinion. She did the design of bringing this together, but you know, they, it, it truly is a beautiful, beautiful quilt. And after we got it finished, she put it together and I did the hand quilting around every single hexagon in the entire quilt. We entered it in the state fair and it got a ribbon. So <laughs> it was all good. <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, the quilting took, I don't know, it took years because I, I was living the life. I was doing work. I was doing whatever. And quilting was not my full-time exercise. So it was, uh, uh, but a labor of love because it really then does complete what my grandmother had started. And someone had, Marilyn, uh, someone had asked why she never finished them. And there's part of my story deals with what I can surmise about that. Of course, she passed away in 1972 and we didn't even, I didn't even know they existed. Mm -hmm. So the story is created out of things mom told me, but uh, I don't know. It's just, a, it, it is sort of astounding that she would start all of these. And then because we were doing quilting all the time while we were on the farm, that she would never, she never brought them up. She never talked about them. It was like, that was my life before I got married. And I didn't have time the rest of my entire life, which I don't get it. I don't know. It's a real mystery. It um, kind of goes to show that we have, we encounter things like that really pretty frequently um, with quilts that come to us at the museum. And it's just wonderful that you've taken the time, Carol, to to collect what you can. Um, we're always preaching to anybody who will listen, label your quilts. You know, if you know the story behind your family quilts, if you are the person who holds that information, you know, for gosh sake, write it down because um, where will it go if you don't write it down or, you know, how can you pass that along? I'm looking at the clock, it's 12.59. My goodness, it's been such a wonderful chat. I wanna be sure we get to see everybody else's pictures that they shared with me. Um, so um, I think Diane, you're next. And then somebody in the chat wants to hear about the quilt that's sitting behind you too. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll talk about the quilt behind me for, well, would it work better now or later on the quilt behind me, Megan? Um, later and I'll take off the screen share so people can see it again. Got it. Okay, this is Tita which um, was done for <clears throat> Donna DeSoto's challenge inspired by endangered species. It is in her book with the same name and it went to Houston last year. Um, I challenged myself to use the Susan Carlson fabric collage method on this quilt. And um, it was also the first time I'd used kind of a faux um, leather uh, piping on there. Mm. I've got a whole story about working with eyes and faces and it totally scared me because I didn't think I had the skill set. Um, anyway, this, this one was in Houston and this was one of the two that went to Paducah's uh, National Quilt Museum um, this fall. Okay, uh, this one was done for the uh, Suffrage Small Quilt Challenge and that was hosted by um, Dakota County Star Quilters of Minnesota and their Hastings Pioneer Room, which is a little historical museum. Um, and it was based off of the I Voted sticker. Um, it's traveling with that exhibit. It, it also was uh, part of the, the exhibit that went to uh, Paducah's National Quilt Museum. Um, and I, I created that fabric behind it with spoon flower fabric um, and hand dye the red, which is a, a, some nightmare stories about hand dyeing that fabric. Um, but it's supposed to look uh, or look similar to the I voted sticker. 
And in this case, because it was in honor of the 19th Amendment, 100 year anniversary of the 19th Amendment, I wrote she voted over the I. Diane, is that the same that, that we discussed that may be coming to the Quilt Museum later? Yes, I did. I did hear that it might be uh, at uh, the Iowa Quilt Museum next winter, and that would be very exciting. Yeah, we have discussed that as kind of a um, an ancillary exhibit when we get the collection called Deeds with um, Deeds Without Words, Deeds Not Words, which is a suffrage exhibit that's traveling right now. Here's a close. And the other exciting thing. Yes, that, there's a close up of it. The other Another exciting thing was when I was at Paducah, um, I was standing there taking pictures of my quilt and people started talking to me about it. But many people had stories from their grandmothers and mothers about the, you know, the whole suffrage movement. And uh, it was very exciting from a historical standpoint too, just to hear their stories as well as, you know, the stories behind my quilt and the whole reason that um, Hastings Pioneer Room decided to um, host this challenge. Some interesting history. Uh, okay, so this, this is a detailed picture of uh, a new technique I des designed. Here's the overall uh, quilt. Um, it's sunflowers. I did it for the Wisconsin Quilt Expo last year and it's traveling. Um, the, the technique I designed with the floral wire uh, helps give the floor, the um, petals, I'm sorry, uh, dimension. And what I like about it is one, they're bendable so they can kind of change shapes. And two, they give realistic shadows. Um, as designers, uh, all the ladies will tell you, it is hard to um, design in shadows that are gonna be realistic. And I kind of skipped that part by making my own real shadows. <laughs> I, I further challenged myself by using all selvages in this quilt and hand dyeing them using only three different colors. And I achieved a lot of variation by uh, how watered down, um, you know, how much water I added to the paint to get the different colors. Uh, and this is the one that I worked on, you know, in, through COVID. This is all English uh, paper piecing, um, hand, hand pieced in, um, hexagons. There's over 500 hexagons in here. Um, but I used um, my own technique to help create the right shape, which means on some of the hexes, I individually construct them like a puzzle to overlap to get a little bit of the the black head and the blue water into one hexi to create this image. Um, I was honored that it was juried into the Road to California last week. All right, those are fantastic, Diane. I'm gonna hang on, I'm just gonna turn off the share for a second so we can see the quilt behind you. Tell us about that one, speaking of hexes. Um, so, <laughs> I challenge myself, I make it always harder for myself. I don't know why. This was originally a row robin exchange that went wrong. I did not like the results of what I got back and I could have made it into a baby quilt or something, but instead I took it all apart. I have a class that I teach called Quilt As You Go Hexies and um, I use I, and it's about a five inch hexi, so it comes together rather quickly. Um, but I used the, the top of this row robin and made my inside hexi, and then I used a neutral uh, cream color backing. So it looked very wild, uh, but that was the result of me cutting up this row robin and all the variety of colors that, that I got. So <laughs> it's fun. I liked it. It, I really, I really love it. I love it. Thank you. All right, Jessica, tell us about these quilts that we're looking at here. Sure, thank you. I just put all of mine on one screen, so I'll just kind of refer to their position. Um, the upper left, the black and pink is a great example, again, of, of what I would use on the vast majority of quilts that I either make or sketch. Um, or at least think about in this color palette. And some of them appear a little white, I think on screen, but they are all different shades of pink. 
Um, that quilt is called In the Right Direction. It has a whole host of meaning behind it. I'll save that one though. But it hung at um, QuiltCon 2018 in um, Nashville. And it's also a pattern that I have too. It is a fun make. Um, I One of the elements that I really love um, in quilting is playing around with negative space, whether it is true, like open it, like space that you just play with either with the quilting or when we get to the bottom right one like how multi-dimensional designs can come into play so um, that quilt is a good representation representation again of of my favorite color palette i'm going to save the upper right and come back to it the lower left is just a small lone star that i made um will my I'll get into that story in a minute in the upper right one. But anyway, I, I needed to practice making some Lone Stars and then I custom quilted all of it. So this is a smaller piece. I think it finishes at around like 31 by 31. And again, I was talking about like improving my quilting, you know, skill because that's definitely my weakest link. And so I was practicing on that. It's also a great representation of just like a color palette that I'm drawn to. Um, these are all Juicy Juice. He's a designer. His name is Giuseppe. His brand name is Juicy Juice. They're all of his spectrostatic um, uh, fabrics, which are not, they're not solids, but they read solid. That's what I'm most drawn to. I, I do a lot of solid colored quilts, but I also really like subtle blenders um, is, what I, is what I'm most going to play with. The bottom right one is a quilt that I just made this year. This was a part of the like, I have new ideas and I wanna do something. And this is a new pattern I actually have coming out on Thursday. I actually physically have it here because I just wanna show, well, I'll do it at the end, but I, what I wanna show or explain later is that um, I did color match quilting in the whole section, in every section of the quilt. So I use 13 different threads. They all, so there's a purple, there's a lilac, there's a light pink, there's a dark pink. You may not be able to see it in that photo, but I have the physical quilt here. Um, and so I laugh too, because Megan, you talked earlier about the projects that you're doing with your children. And one of them is the half square triangle and you're, you're done with it. <laughs> This is half square triangle, which is my favorite block in the world. You hand me 250 HSTs to trim and I'm happy as a lark. I love them. I love what you can do with them. I love how they can uh, become new things that you just never envision. And so a lot of my work, but not all, um, has an HST base to it. It's, you either love them or hate them, I swear, a quilter, like there's no in between. Um, but what I really would like to talk about is that quilt in the upper right corner. So, um, I mentioned my, um, it was my great grandma. I just call her grandma. Her name was Grandma Georgie. Um, she, beautiful quilting, um, did most of her work by hand, hand piecing, hand quilting. And like I mentioned, she passed away when I was 20. So I had many opportunities that I could have said at some point, hey, grandma, would you show me how you do this? And I never did. And that's still an emotional thing for me um, to this day. I mean, she's been gone almost 20 years and I, I still wish I would have asked her. So if you have a chance to teach someone or want to ask someone to show you, please do it. Um, but she had this beautiful quilt in her bedroom. I will never forget it. I will never forget her room. You would open the door. It was freezing. She liked to keep her room cold. And I remember when I would go to her house, she lived in the same town that I did. I'm from Southern Iowa originally in a town that's very much like Winterset. And um, I would sneak into her room every now and then just because I like to see, like feel how cold it was. And I like to admire the quilt that she had on her bed that she made. It's a beautiful blue and white Lone Star. And it's got several shades of blue in the Lone Star in the background as well. It's, it's an amazing piece. I honestly can't tell you that I ever remember having a conversation with her about it. I don't know if she, I mean, I'm sure she saw me go into her room and wonder what I was doing, but um, I, we never had a conversation that I'm aware of about that quilt. So my grandma passed and one day my mom called me not long after that. And she said, I have two things for you um, from grandma. And one of them was the board game, Sorry, because we love to play that together. And I still, and it's, it's so beat up and I still have it and I love it and I can't believe it's mine. And the second was that quilt that was on her bed. And I have kept it with me. 
I rarely get it out. I make people, if they want to see it or touch it, they have to put on gloves. None of my quilts you could touch with your bear. Like, I don't care what you do with them, but not that quilt. Um, it's very special to me. So I've always, so it took me 12 years, even after that time for me to learn to quilt. And she is the reason that I was like, I need to do this. You know, I need to honor my grandma. And then I was at the Iowa Quilt Museum hearing a closing lecture from Victoria Finley Wolf. And she talks about like her relationship with her grandma and quilting. And I don't know what it was, but like this moment just clicked where I was like, well, what if I made a quilt? And what if it was me and my grandma making it together as much as I can? What elements can I bring in? What can I do um, to do this. So this is the first in the series. This is called Fade Away Lone Star. And there's multiple meanings. And I know I'm taking a bit of time, but if you would, let me please just tell a little bit more of it. It's, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, and I'm going to have more about it on my blog. Um, I have the story written. It took a very long time. Um, and so there will be more detail there. But okay. So a couple of the elements to explain that I brought in of myself and my grandma. So my grandma loved blue and white. That was her favorite color palette. So that background is dark navy. I would have picked um, black and pink, but again, I'm bringing her in. So I chose navy and pink to make this quilt. We'll talk about those stars in the upper left and lower left corner, but those are hand quilted uh, lone stars, partial lone stars you can see. And I'll talk about the meaning in a minute. But again, my grandma did, she did hand piecing and hand quilting. I did not hand piece anything, but I did hand quilt those stars. So this quilt is my reflection of what happens when someone passes and it's about my grandma. So that center lone star is my grandma and it's my memories of her or it's a memory of anyone else who may have passed. It's full of vibrancy. I custom quilted all the different color of pink sections. I mean, it's nothing crazy, but it's just, I, each section is slightly different and unique. The gaps uh, in the star that you can see are essentially those moments after someone has passed that you sort of forget about them, right? And over time, the, the way in which you forget someone continues to change and grow until eventually it just sort of fades away. Now I've not forgotten my grandma. It's just my processing of death. So this is also a grief quilt for me. So again, you can see at the ends, those pink parts just sort of, of, of the star fade away. It goes flat, the quilting goes flat. The rest of that quilt is quilted in a three quarter inch cross hatch, which took a very long time to do. But when it gets to that part where essentially you have forgotten that person, it, it, it goes to straight line quilting. It's, a, it's, it's intentionally done that way. The stars in the upper left and lower left are representative of me and my mom and my daughter and other people that I love. Our stars are still being formed. Our memories are still being made. Memories of, that people have of us are still being made. And one day when we pass, we will become those center stars and people will hold, um, I hope, good memories of us. And so this is why I mentioned earlier that it took me a long time to get this quilt process in my brain and, um, and, and, and done. Um, obviously, I'm, you can tell my voice is cracking. I'm emotional about it because it just has a lot of meaning to me. And it is, um, it is, it is good to have done this and to feel like my grandma would be proud of it too. It's probably the most part. And the quilt is going to hang, I think I mentioned again, um, at the virtual QuiltCon show, it was juried into the show coming up in later February. So if I spoke that story too long or whatever, um, or you missed the parts of it, like I said, I'm gonna be publishing in the next couple of weeks, kind of that full story um, on my blog about it. What an interesting story, Jessica. And I, I, um, I had not, I'm not really an artist myself, um, I, but I've, so I've been really intrigued by the idea of people who use art um, to process grief. Um, that's not something that, um, that speaks to me, but I really am intrigued by that. And I think that it's important that we all have a way or a something, an outlet um, that helps us process that. Gosh, we could keep going for a really long time. And it's just been so lovely to talk to all of you. Um, 
if you would, Carol, Diane, Jessica, Melanie, just go ahead and type your stuff into the chat one more time. So it's really fresh in people's minds, how they can contact you. If you miss it, um, anybody who's watching today, if you miss it, um, don't get it from the, the links here. Um, just reach out to me um, and I'm happy to connect you to these folks, to Jessica and to Diane and Melanie and Carol. And as I mentioned before, Carol's book um, is going to be for sale mm -hmm. in the um, Iowa Quilt Museum gift shop. Um, and I'm gonna let these guys type their stuff in real quick. And then I'm gonna add in the address for the Iowa Quilt Museum, which is really easy, iowaquiltmuseum.org. And when you go there, there's a place where you can, there's a link to our online store. There's a link where you can make a donation. If you're enjoying the speaker series that we're putting together and would like to make a monetary donation to the Quilt Museum, we'd be greatly appreciative of that. There is a link to join our email list um, we never share that email with anybody but ourselves, and we um, send out occasional updates on events, programs, sales in our gift shop, um, etc. So you'll just keep abreast on what's happening in the Iowa Quilt Museum and um, with quilt events that are happening across the state. Um, and then the last thing I would like to say, oh, um, if you know somebody who wasn't able to find to join our video today, um, this will be recorded and added to our website as well. So iowaquiltmuseum.org is our address. And I gotta make sure I send it to everyone. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, so Diane, go ahead. Uh, just one quick thing. Um, I think I saw a couple questions in the chat uh, for me that we didn't get to uh, time to address, which is fine. Um, but if, if those people could just email me, I'd be happy to answer their questions. Sure. All right, thanks. And, and I'm sure that's true of anybody. Um, Melanie and Jessica, Carol, Diane, all have been very responsive to me. And so I, I know that they would be happy to talk to you as well. And I'll just reiterate my invitation that I put out earlier in the meeting. If you know of somebody who is involved in quilting in Iowa and you think that they would make a great guest on this program, um, please be the person who connects me to them or connects them to me. And I would love to, to do that. Um, we are kind of alternating each week, um, talking about our exhibit and then talking about other things that happen in the state of Iowa. Um, next week, we will be visiting with Teddy Pruitt, who is a Florida collector and appraiser. And she has three, five quilts in our current exhibit. And I believe we will also be joined by Bonnie Hunter. That's the plan anyway. Bonnie, Bonnie lives in the mountains and has a tough time with her connection sometimes. But our plan is next week to meet with Teddy Pruitt and Bonnie Hunter. Um, and we've got some really other wonderful programs coming up with um, connections to Iowa as well, including to just today, I spoke with somebody who's going to hopefully help us um, with a program on collection of Mary Barton's quilts and fabric collection um, that is held at the State Historical Museum. So anything else that you want to share, Melanie, Carol, Diane, or Jessica? Thank you. Just my thanks. It thank you, wonderful. everybody. Thank, thank you, Megan. And thank you to everyone who's joined us. Absolutely. Um, it was a lovely little coffee program that we had here today. I would someday love to have coffee with all of you in person. Um, and we are all anxiously awaiting the day that we can do that kind of thing. In the meantime, thank you so much to everyone who joined us virtually today. Thank you, Carol, Diane, Jessica, Melanie, for taking time to share with us the way that you contribute to the Iowa Quiltscape. We are happy and proud to have you, to call you Iowans and to have you join us in the wonderful world of quilting. So have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Stay safe and warm and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.